Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of James Krausneck? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. James and Kathleen Krausneck were from Michigan. They met when they were students at Western Michigan University. The couple married in 1974 and had a daughter named Sarah a few years later. James told people that he had earned a doctorate, but in reality, his dissertation had not been accepted. He was supposed to make some changes to it, but for some reason, he never did. Instead, he pretended that he actually earned a PhD and took a job teaching at a college in Lynchburg, Virginia. In the latter half of 1981, James accepted a position with the Eastman Kodak Company. Just as he had done with the college, he told them that he had a PhD. The family moved to a suburb of Rochester, New York, called Brighton, and lived in a house at 33 Del Rio Drive. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On February 19, 1982, 29-year-old Kathleen Krausneck was murdered as she was sleeping in her bed. According to James, he left for work that day at 6.30 a.m. Kathleen and Sarah were both sleeping at that time. When James returned home just before 5 p.m., he noticed that the garage door was open and there was glass on the kitchen floor. Somebody had broken the glass in the door between the garage and the kitchen. James found his wife dead in her bed. He picked up three-and-a-half-year-old Sarah from her bedroom and took her to a neighbor's house. According to the neighbor, James wasn't able to say anything. He just made a guttural sound and looked horrified. The neighbor called the police and said, please come to Del Rio Drive. There has been, I think, a murder. I find it interesting that the neighbor assumed that a murder occurred without James ever saying a word. How did she know that he didn't just see a spider or something like that? Here's what the police found during their investigation. Kathleen had been killed while she was sleeping in bed by a single blow from an axe with a long handle. The axe was still embedded in her skull. The axe belonged to James. It was normally stored in the garage and used to chop wood. The axe did not contain any fingerprints at all, as if it had been wiped down. What's more curious is the police didn't find fingerprints anywhere in the house. There were no fingerprints at all, despite the house being occupied by three people who, in theory, would regularly touch various items. In the garage, there was a bathroom rug hanging as if it was there to dry. The police said it was damp. In the dining room, someone had positioned various items like silverware, a tea set, and the contents of Kathleen's purse as if they were attempting to steal them. The items were neatly arranged. Nothing of value was stolen from the dining room or from anywhere in the house. For example, there was $43 in cash in plain sight on a dresser not far from Kathleen's body. The glass in the door between the garage and the kitchen had been broken, as if somebody had forced entry into the house. Sarah had been in the house with her dead mother the entire day, but reportedly she was unharmed. The family dog, Amicus, had been found in the basement, also unharmed. The medical examiner determined that Kathleen's time of death was sometime between 2.30 a.m. and 9.30 a.m. James had an alibi starting at 6.30 a.m. Various employees at Eastman Kodak, who worked with James, said he was at work all day on February 19. The police discovered that James had lied about having a Ph.D., his employer found out about this, and this could have led to some trouble regarding his continued employment. The police found a pamphlet in the family vehicle that had a number of services advertised on it. One of those services was marriage counseling. They believe that Kathleen found out about the Ph.D. deception, and this caused problems in the marriage. James spoke to the police briefly and agreed to make his way to the police station the next day so that he could be formally interviewed. Instead, he took his daughter and traveled to Michigan, where he was originally from. 
The police asked to speak to Sarah about a month later, but James refused, saying it had already been too long. The police used a couple of psychics to impede the investigation. Their tactic was successful. I'm guessing the only thing the psychics accurately stated was that the police were gullible. The investigation came to a halt after a while. There was simply not enough evidence to file charges against anyone. James moved on with his life. By the early 1990s, he was living in Washington State near his sister and had remarried. James had initially maintained contact with Kathleen's family. They believed in his innocence for many years. Over time, his level of contact with Kathleen's family decreased. Sometime around the middle of 1990, James joined a company which was based near Seattle, Washington. He worked for divisions they operated in Georgia and California. James was successful. He worked his way up to vice president of marketing and sales. At some point, James divorced and married someone else. In 2009, he and his wife lived in Gig Harbor, Washington. James had a 41-foot boat named Amicus, the same name as the family dog that James had in the house on Del Rio Drive in Brighton, New York. In 2012, James and his wife purchased a home in Arizona. The murder investigation was reopened in 2016. James was indicted on November 1, 2019, on one count of murder in the second degree. On September 24, 2022, he was convicted. He is scheduled to be sentenced on November 7, 2022. Considering he is now 70 years old, presumably his sentence is going to take him past his life expectancy. Now moving to my analysis. Was James Krausneck actually guilty of murder? Let's take a look at the evidence both for and against the idea that he was guilty, starting with the inculpatory factors. James lied about having a PhD. This was going to cause him some trouble at work and may have caused problems between him and his wife. Also, just the fact that James lied about having a PhD is not a good sign about his relationship with the truth. Kathleen had been killed with an axe that belonged to James. His wife was killed with a single blow from the axe while she was sleeping. This suggests that whoever used the axe had some experience with it or with similar axes. If they had missed or not delivered a lethal blow on the first swing, Kathleen would have woken up, but she never did. There were no fingerprints found on the axe or from anywhere in the house. This would mean that the killer was impulsive enough to commit a burglary, not realizing there were two people and a dog in the house, but conscientious enough to clean up the crime scene thoroughly. Silverware and other items in the dining room may have been staged to look like a burglary. For example, the police said that a tea set looked like it was carefully positioned on the floor and a sugar container was sitting upright. Nothing was actually stolen from the house, even valuables in plain view. Why would a burglar have killed Kathleen at all? If she was sleeping, she did not interrupt the burglary. Furthermore, if a burglar was going to kill Kathleen, why didn't he kill Sarah? One of the employees at Eastman Kodak said that James was in a hurry on February 19. His behavior was different than usual. The famous forensic pathologist, Dr. Michael Bodden, testified that Kathleen died before 6.30 a.m. He based this on the fact that her body temperature was measured at 81 degrees at 5 p.m. on February 19. The original medical examiner had used a temperature decrease of 1.5 degrees per hour as a starting point to build the time range. But Michael Bodden recalculated this using 1 degree per hour because Kathleen was under an electric blanket. It's worth noting that there is a debate about whether the blanket was on or off when the police arrived. Michael also believed that there were signs of undigested food in Kathleen's stomach. If Kathleen was murdered before 6.30 a.m., then it's hard to imagine how James is innocent. Now moving to the exculpatory factors. There are no witnesses to the murder, no video, no physical evidence whatsoever ties James to the crime. James and Kathleen did not have a history of domestic violence. There was evidence of forced entry into the house. Someone had broken the glass in the door between the garage and the kitchen. If a burglar did this, it may explain how they found the axe, because the axe was stored in the garage. They would have walked right by it 
to get to that door. One employee at Eastman Kodak said that James was in a hurry on the day of the murder, but another co-worker said that he was acting perfectly normal. A forensic pathologist testified for the defense, challenging the assertions made by Michael Biden, saying that he was using an incorrect method to estimate how fast the temperature of a dead body decreases. She also said there were no signs of undigested food in Kathleen's stomach. She believed that Kathleen died somewhere between 2.30 a.m. and 7.30 a.m., meaning there was a one-hour window where the murder could have been committed by someone other than James. Of all the various medical examiners who have looked at the case over the years, Michael Bodden appears to be the only one who said the time range for Kathleen's death did not extend past 6.30 a.m. A man named Edward Larrabee confessed to murdering Kathleen. This confession was made before he died in 2014. Edward had a long history of serious crimes, and the police believed that he murdered a music teacher in 1991. At the time Kathleen was murdered, Edward lived less than a mile from her residence. It's worth noting that Edward did not correctly state some of the details of the crime. When considering all the evidence, do I think that James Krausnick is guilty of murder? I think that he probably is guilty in reality, but there is no way he is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Much of the case against James is based on this body temperature decrease formula. I find it interesting that for 37 years, it never occurred to anybody that the formula could be incorrect. All of a sudden, Michael Biden comes onto the scene, says, how about one degree instead of one and a half degrees, and James is convicted. To characterize this evidence as flimsy is actually being generous to the prosecution. This evidence is not convincing at all. The state made a big deal about how there was no evidence that someone else committed the crime. This case was really about an absence of evidence, which of course is dependent on the idea that the police did a proper investigation and gathered all the evidence that was available. The police said that there should have been DNA from an intruder. There should have also been fingerprints. This is a dangerous premise for prosecuting a man for murder. I find it interesting that in so many murders like this, when there's no sign of a burglary, the police say that the husband did it. In this case, there were signs of a burglary, but now the police say the scene was staged. They made this determination because they didn't think that burglars would position a tea set in an organized manner, but a killer would have. I think this assertion is kind of insulting to burglars, like they are not sophisticated enough to properly position a tea set. Is this a test for burglars that cops use? I imagine the situation where a suspect is sitting in an interrogation room, the officers come in, they push a tea set across the table and say, here, arrange this tea set for high tea. The officers then exit the room and stand behind a one-way mirror, chuckling. This is our guy. Watch how he puts the teapot too close to the sugar bowl. When the suspect is done arranging the tea set, the officers barge back into the interrogation room. Well, I see you have scones and tea sandwiches. You've arranged this tea set for afternoon tea. But I said high tea, and all non-burglars know that high tea is not a fancy tea. I knew you were guilty. Is this really a reasonable method to separate burglars from killers? Another element that doesn't make sense about this case is the situation with the electric blanket. If James was the killer, he knew that the time of death would be critical in determining if he was going to switch to a prison-based career. Clearly, James was intelligent. He knew that he would be the one to discover the body. There was no reason anyone else would have visited the house during the day. Why didn't James leave the electric blanket on and then remove it after coming home? This seems like a critical mistake that would have been easy to avoid. Moving to the next question, what do I think happened in this case? This is just a theory, my opinion. For some reason, perhaps related to arguing over an incomplete PhD, James decided to murder his wife. He knew that he would be a suspect, therefore, after killing his wife, he tried to make it look as though someone had committed a burglary. He tried to be careful, but didn't think things through as far as the body temperature. Even still, there really wasn't much evidence against James. He managed to get away with the crime. Years later, the state talked to Michael Bodden, who was willing to say that the murder occurred before 6.30 a.m. 
The jurors were dazzled by the fact that Michael Biden has been on television and has performed over 20,000 autopsies during his career. This does not include autopsies that he supervised. In addition, the jurors felt as though James looked like a killer. For example, during one interview, a member of the jury said that James was very stoic and had no facial expression whatsoever. James was convicted despite the presence of reasonable doubt. Now moving to my final thoughts. It's not clear if the incomplete PhD has any role in this case, but I think this could offer some insight into the behavior of James. He was willing to lie to people for his entire life and not give it a second thought. Most people lying about a degree would always be looking over their shoulder, worried that someday they would be caught, but not James. Similarly, if he committed the murder, one would think that the guilt and nervousness would cause him great stress. Yet he went on to have a productive life and a good deal of success. He didn't really seem to be too worried about the homicide. I think that the deceptive behavior about the PhD is a sign that James could be deceptive about anything. This is why a lack of remorse is such a problem. It allows a person a great deal of freedom to commit offenses and avoid any emotional consequences. Those are my thoughts on the case of James Krausneck. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be as intriguing as the afternoon tea burglar detection method. Thanks for watching.